And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is indeed Friday and welcome to Climate Change Roundtable number 69 in a series. Today we've got a full show. We've got a little bit of climate craziness to show you. And we also have esteemed climatologist, Dr. Judith Curry, who is going to be joining us and talking about her new book about climate risk, which is really a fantastic book. I recommend everybody get it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, morning, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we all then. jump in at the same Practice time. Practice <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so before we get to the book review and, and the nice PowerPoint that Dr. Curry has prepared for us, I want to talk about some of the crazy climate news of the week. You know, every week it seems like they keep piling on higher and deeper uh, as in terms of, you know, the kind of stuff that goes on that they make claims about. Well, Guess what? New York City is now going to come after your pizza ovens. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Coal and wood fire pizzerias are killing the planet. We've got to stop them. Yeah, right. Uh, we know the, how much emissions that makes up in the whole scheme of things. Uh, that's that's just really important to get rid of right now. Um, As a Chicago guy, I'm just glad that they took aim at New York pizza and left my deep dish alone. <laughs> that's the that's a real victory yeah. for me. <laughs> I wonder yeah, I if it's if it's just pizza places that they're cracking down on because Indian restaurants use the wood fire stove too for tandoor <laughs> and stuff. So that's oh, a no, whole no, new no, 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 no. India gets a pass. China gets a pass. So Indian and Chinese restaurants, they're okay. <laughs> they're okay. <laughs> that's pretty good, actually. <laughs> All righty. So apparently Greta has weighed in on it. Yes. Every time you put in a pizza, how dare you? <laughs> Nice. There you go. You had it ready. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So anyway, <coughs> excuse me. The next one is giant car giant kites could pull cargo ships across the ocean. I don't understand what it is about climate change zealotry, where they have to go backwards in time for technology that we've abandoned decades or centuries ago. Why do they have to keep doing that? If well, I, I mean, there is a reason why we abandoned. Um, you know, using sailing ships in the first place, it's because we can have better routes by using, um, you know, diesel, I guess, or whatever it is back when they were using steam or whatever it happens to be. Um, you're kind of limited. If you read about, you know, the, um, the Columbus expeditions, for example, they're incredibly limited by the time of year it is and what routes that they're able to take in order to get back and forth across the Atlantic in particular. Um, so I, I can't imagine that they're going to go exclusively wind driven because mm -hmm. there's just no way that most of the time they'll be able to get their, uh, trips done in a timely fashion instead of taking, you know, four months to cross the Atlantic like it used to. Uh, so we'll see, I guess. Yeah, it, it's really going to be something, especially when they hit inclement weather and uh, they're trying to pull that kite in. That'll be fun, right? You're telling me this tiny little kite isn't able to battle a massive storm? Who would have thought? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go on to the next crazy topic. Chris Martz, he's a, a college graduate, recent college graduate in meteorology, who has become quite a force on Twitter talking about some of the insanity that goes on. And he basically did this wonderful mic drop moment put down of this guy by the name of Gerald Cutney, who is uh, apparently the leader of climate brawl, whatever that is. He liked to get on there and fight, but apparently mm. 
Uh, he's, uh, Chris says to him, if you spend a little more time arguing your points in good faith instead of mm -hmm. wasting your 280 character Twitter limit with the same <laughs> three hashtags in every post like a girl does on an Instagram to clout Chase, your arguments would be more convincing. Well, he's absolutely right. I mean, then you look at Michael Mann and some of these other folks that are on Twitter and they have, you know, half of the tweet is hashtags. And, yeah. you know, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. All yeah. right. Yeah, there's Gerald Cutney. I, um, he's something else. If you yeah, really you're want right. Some... I mean, it's right here. It's the same three, the three hashtags. <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, because apparently climate crisis doesn't get across well enough, so you have to add climate emergency to that too. <laughs> Don't forget the brawl. Yeah, yeah. In, in regards to the the Twitter drama stuff, I do think it's interesting. Um, if, at least on my for you tab, there are an unbelievable number of accounts that are like Professor X Y Z is the account name, and then they'll have you know <sighs> Professor of Climate Change at blah 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 university and they'll they'll all tweet relatively the same content every day um with the same hashtags with the same long um explanations they'll go after the same people and they're associated with universities so i'm kind of curious as to how it is that all of these professors are you know acting so coordinated uh in this sphere i'm sure that a lot of our viewers who i have Seen on Twitter as well have run across these guys. Um, it's very strange, and I I wanted to call them AI at first, but they mm -hmm. link to their professor page on their, <laughs> um, you know, on their or their Twitter, whatever it's called, their profile. Okay. Otherwise, I would have thought that they were bots because there are a lot of bots out there. You got to be careful that you don't waste your time arguing with an actual robot <laughs> instead of. <laughs> Uh, talking to a real person and really engaging. It's its a terrible place to try to get any kind of good discussion. Right, right. It's just basically a bunch of people yelling at each other. That's all Twitter is. It is climate brawl. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So apparently the, great, the next big effect of climate change driven heat waves is affecting squirrels. Yes, squirrels are splooting. <laughs> scroll down a little bit there, Anthony. Uh, Andy, look at that. What That's just what's called mean? splooting because, <laughs> gosh, it's hot, and we have to spread out to dis dissipate our body heat uh, and absorb a little coolness from the ground. Or, gosh, yeah. you know, you think squirrels might have been doing that like a few millennia ago before climate change happened? This is this is really starting to look catastrophic to me, Anthony. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uh, Squirrel splooting, another victim of climate change. Huh. All right, finally, King Charles has declared that we now need a climate doom clock. And he ran this uh, presentation the other day, run the video, and he, it's basically uh, uh, give me it's one hilarious. Second. There you go. Uh, give me one second, Anthony. I just have to just, share just, it a different way. Run. It's uh, the, I, the, for the audio to play. I just have to share it a different oh, way. Give me I one see. quick okay. second. All right. Well, while Andy's working out the technical details, we'll point out that there's already a doomsday clock. It's from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And, um, you know, that never happened. We, we've never met doomsday on the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists clock. Right, we've never we had nuclear Armageddon. So I suspect that we'll never reach climate Armageddon with the, um, you know, a climate doomsday clock. It'll just keep inching closer and then something will happen like, you know, um, they'll reach an agreement at the latest, um, you know, cop meeting. Oh, the yeah. world is saved again. And so they'll, they'll dial it back a little bit. And then, uh oh, uh, somebody's somebody's using fossil fuels where they shouldn't be and they'll inch it forward again. That's going to be pretty much the whole thing. All right. So here we go. Oh, Your Majesty, Mayor of London, Excellencies. It's an incredible honor. Thank you both for joining me on the stage for this symbolic moment. That's the Mayor of London there, along with um, King Charles, so, formerly known as Prince. The powerful King's speech film yeah. reminds us <laughs> your tireless campaigning on climate change and environment issues for over 50 years provides exemplary leadership for us all. Your presence here gives us the incredible motivation to continue to 
Maybe. Let me know if I should jump Why ahead or anything. Us? Yeah, move it ahead. They're yeah. boring. Yeah, I know, right? I want to see this clock. There it is. There it oh, is. Back it go. up. There, they're hitting the button. Two, one. It... <laughs> wow, wasn't that This exciting? is the big moment. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at that. This is all the time. Six like... years and 24 days now before doom. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> If their God. predictions are as good as their technical know-how, they're really going to be on with this one. <laughs> These guys, wow. Okay, so enough insanity aside. Let's get down to some real science and some real things, courtesy of Dr. Judith Curry and her book. She has written a, a fantastic book about climate risk and our response to it. There it is, Climate Uncertainty <laughs> and Risk. And um, I recommend everyone rush out to Amazon and buy this right now. Seriously, it's that good. It it can, encapsulates a lot of the primary arguments and then reduces them into easy to understand points as well as gives some possible solutions. So it's really an excellent essay. Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Curry. Well, thank you, Anthony. Thank you for having me again. Sure thing. Um, so we have a PowerPoint that you've prepared that we want to go through where you can talk about the different aspects of the book. So basically, I'm just going to turn it over to you and you can lead with your presentation. Okay, so we'll go through slowly and I encourage people to pipe in with questions as you have them. Yep. And I think Andy is in charge of actually moving yes. the slide show forward. I got it. <laughs> okay, so what this, it, it's a little bit hard to describe in the sense that this is an unusual book. I mean, there's nothing else out there to, to compare it to. Um, basically, it's an intellectual counterpoint to the whole UN IPCC narrative, not to mention its more um, alarming incarnations. The book is about rethinking the climate change problems, the risks we're facing, and how we can respond. Um, the book is published by an academic press, and it's multidisciplinary. For example, on um, Amazon, it's categorized in three different categories. One is climatology, the other one is history and philosophy of science, and the third is public affairs and policy. So, you know, I'm encompassing all of those um, disciplines um, in a well-referenced um, academic sort of way. Yeah, if you go to the Kindle, I think that lists all three. They have different, yeah. they have different categories for, you know, all of these. You have to scroll down to see it. But um, yeah, it, it categorizes it different for the different Kindle versus the paperback. That's pretty. Oh yeah, here we go. Right here. <laughs> Philosophy, public affairs, and and. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a wide-ranging book, and um, and again, this is an academic press, so I had to pass muster in all of these disciplines. It's, it has like 1,500 footnotes um, documenting. 1,500, wow. Yeah. Now, the challenge in writing this was for this to pass muster in academic circles, but I also wanted it to be readable and understandable. I had a uh, sort of my own peer review audience of musicians, anthropologists, lawyers, and a whole host of people, you know, is this readable and getting feedback, you know, is this too much? And, and another challenge that I faced is I want people across the spectrum, you know, from the most alarmed to the biggest conceivable denier, if you will, to want to read this and to learn from it. And I didn't want to turn anyone off, particularly in the first part of the book. Um, you know, if you, I want people not to be able to figure out which tribe I'm in, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, it's designed to appeal to the full spectrum. So it's sort yeah. of a challenge writing this. Now, there are three parts to the book and each of these part is sort of, driven by these three fundamental questions. Um, the first main question for part one is, how did we come to think that we can get rid of bad weather by eliminating CO2 emissions? I mean, that's essentially where we're at right now. And then I speculate on how might 
climate variability and change and extreme weather evolve over the 21st century. And the IPCC projections give us a very, very narrow perspective on this. And then finally, I look at how can we balance human prosperity and flourishing in a changing climate while minimizing the impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, you know, what I'm trying to do here, you know, in a book that's less than 300 pages long. Yeah. You know, Dr. Kerr, <laughs> I just wanted to chime in real quick. We're getting a ton of questions from our viewers right now for you. Uh, do you mind every now and then if I if I put them on screen just so they can kind oh, of... Oh, get... sure. If you want something to... Um, something oh. from on to right now or... Um, uh, no, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, to stop you right now. I just wanted to kind of give you a, a quick heads up that we just had. Good, good, last because yeah. I was, wasn't, I, I do see them coming. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry for you. Okay. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So part one, this is where I address, um, how did we come to think that we can get rid of bad weather by eliminating CO2 emissions? Well, there's two chapters in this that, that really are central to this argument. The one deals with consensus. And, and basically this chapter takes a philosophy of science and social psychology of scientists perspective mm -hmm. on trying to understand how we all came to agree with this and how this became so polarized in the scientific community. And the other one is, um, politics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. On the consensus side. Um, so, so basically the summary of this chapter is cognitive biases in the context of an institutionalizing consensus building process, otherwise known as group think have yeah. resulted in the consensus being confirmed in a self-reinforcing way. The IPCC consensus has then become canonized through a political process bypassing the long and complex scientific validation process as to whether the conclusions are actually true. And then we have an extended group of scientists who derive confidence in the consensus in a secondhand manner from the institutional authority of the IPCC and the emphatic portrayal of the consensus. Um, and the, the chapter goes into, you know, the heretics and, you know, the climate heretics and how some people came to be labeled in that way, even um, actively, you know, very reputable climate scientists who have been labeled as deniers for basically doing their job as scientists. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the next slide does a better job of um, the whole politics one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dilbert. So, I mean, I, I showed this one at the Heartland Conference if you were there, but I'm, I'm pulling it up again because hey, you probably don't remember it. But, you know, we have policymakers misusing science and we have scientists mis misusing policy relevant science. And in all honesty, politicians are behaving like politicians. I mean, scientists. Mm -hmm who are doing stuff on that right column, they're not behaving like scientists. <laughs> they're, 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 they want to yeah. be, um, they want to be media stars. They want to be politicians, whatever. And, um, and I regard a lot of that behavior by scientists on the right to be unethical. But the worst part of this, you see the arrow up there is there's a feedback, a positive yeah. feedback loop between the policy makers and the scientists where they self reinforce this. And this feedback includes media amplification, you know, mm -hmm. by the journalists. 10 years ago, there were just a handful of reporters on the climate beat, Andy Revkin, Fred Pierce. Now there are thousands. There's whole climate yep. desks at <laughs> major. It, it's um, really tough for us to play whack a mole on a weekly basis, <laughs> I, seriously, because there's so much bad reporting out there now uh, okay. by people that are not qualified to even report on science, much less climate science, that just take everything hook, line, and sinker and regurgitate it as if it is truth. And it's just, it's a really tough job that we have to do uh, on climate realism every week. Okay. okay, and then you've got the NGOs. I mean, in the old days, you had Greenpeace, environmental defense, stuff like that, yeah. who in hindsight looked fairly respectable. Now we've got Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil and all of this craziness. And then we have the private sector who see opportunities to make money. And so you've got this whole ecosystem 
that's built up, you know, and the more alarming the narrative, the more they all benefit. So, you know, this yeah. is a, a very unfortunate positive feedback loop that we have going on here. Yep, that's probably the only positive feedback loop actually in climate science. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Okay. Uh, okay. Now in part two, this is, okay. I, I edited my slide deck this morning and forgot to send it to you, but this is the wrong title for part two. The part <laughs> All two right. is, no worries. Is, is, is uncertainty in 21st century climate projections. So, yeah. so that's the title of part two. And there's two main points here. The first one is the climate crisis isn't what it used to be. Okay, now if you read the synthesis report from the IPCC that was just published last February, it was alarm all over the pace and the 8.5, the extreme emission scenarios were featured heavily. However, for over two years, the UN climate negotiators have quietly dropped the 8.5 emission scenario, the extreme emission scenario is no longer used. Um, here's no. low is let, the let me interject for a moment and explain to our viewers, if they're not familiar, that RCP 8.5 is the worst case of the worst case climate scenario into the future that came up with something like six to seven degrees centigrade of warming by the year 2100. And it was uh, a couple of years ago in a peer reviewed paper was basically rebuked because there wasn't enough fossil fuel available on the planet to burn to actually reach that scenario by the year 2100. Is that pretty well accurate, Dr. Curry? Um, pretty much. Um, basically, that they proposed that we would be using six times more coal than, than we're currently using, which is, you know, more than the known recoverable reserves of coal, you know, mm. so that doesn't make a heck of a lot, heck of, a lot of sense. So the yep. extreme emission scenario in the latest IPCC assessment report is associated with four to five degrees centigrade of warming. Okay, now if you look at this figure below, and this is from the COP27 report from the UN climate negotiators um, last fall. Okay, if you look at this, 8.5 is no longer to be seen. 4.5, yeah. which is the moderate emission scenario, is the new reference scenario. And you can see that little red bit, that's sort of the path we're on. We're even moving along at less than 4.5 scenario. And so according to the UN climate negotiators, their best estimate of expected warming by 2100 is 2.1 to 2.9 degrees centigrade. Since we've already warmed by 1.5, two degrees, um, the extreme emission scenario, we, we've, we've cut it in half. We've cut it more than in half than from what it was a few years ago. Okay, like, mm -hmm. wow. I mean, this is great news. Are the UN climate negotiators cheering? Hardly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> doubt it. And, and, and they say, the bottom quote in the right, while the warming is less than we thought, the impacts are worse than we thought. Okay, so, I know, I know, I know. So, so this is what they say. But apart from that, the IPCC and the scientists keep hyping this extreme emission scenario, 8.5. Apparently, the forthcoming U.S. National Climate Assessment, number five, continues to hype the 8.5 scenario. Now, the key point is that once you reject this extreme emission scenario, this makes obsolete most of the climate impacts literature, <laughs> you know, oops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, now back in the old days, say the 1990s, the policymakers were way out in front of the climate scientists and sounding the alarm. Okay, now we've flipped the roles. The, the UN climate negotiators are being relatively moderate, whereas the scientists continue to <laughs> hype the alarm. Mm -hmm. okay. It, it, you know, there's a certain amount of inertia, but um, you would expect, I mean, I just could not believe that the February IPCC synthesis report continued yeah. to hype 8.5 and to hear from people who've reviewed the early drafts of the 
new national climate assessment is that they're continuing to hype the 8.5 scenario. Even President Biden, he's, you know, they had the new social cost of carbon report that he issued in February. Even they have dropped the 8.5 scenario. So the policymakers yeah. are on board and the climate scientists and the IPCC are simply on a different planet. Why okay. do you think they, they're clinging to this, Dr. Curry? Okay. When you, if you want to show an impact, I mean, using that 8.5 scenario is so seductive. If you want to show, you know, that we're going to have crazy worse weather and droughts and mass migration and, and squirrels scooting on their bellies or whatever else the <laughs> impact du jour is, um, you know, this 8.5 scenario, wow, it's really exciting. It gets you publication in nature. It gets you press attention and on and on it goes. So the scientists like it. Um, the economists like it because if they show the difference, you know, they're trying to show cost benefit, you know, that the benefits exceed the cost. Well, if you're use the really alarming extreme emission scenario, it's easy to show um, a high cost benefit. Once the emissions aren't so bad, <laughs> then the cost benefit argument is harder to make. So, I mean, this is why they like it, but we're now in a position where the science has become divorced from anything that's policy relevant. <laughs> that's a powerful <laughs> statement. It is, and it's true. <laughs> And, and people who are saying that, I mean, yeah. you know, we're, we're the misinformers. <laughs> you know, people yeah. Are, you know, it, yeah, I know. It's, um, it, you know, it's, it's changing big time. Yeah. It's changing big time. Okay. Um, this, oh, go on. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Curry. Um, I was wondering on that on that front there, because what you see a lot of the time, and especially when we're trying to write um, for climate realism, which is where we are debunking things that we see in the media over and over and over again, what we get, hi Andy. I, I got the wrong angle up, that's on me. <laughs> uh, what we end up getting is we see a very alarming statement made by a journalist. It'll say something like, study finds that by 2030, all moose will be extinct. <laughs> And then what you do, what happens when you go to the study that they link to is they say, we analyzed several models and we found that in the RCP 8.5 emission scenario model, we found that X and X, Y, Z warming effect will happen and then all the moose will be dead. But they never report in the actual, you know, the actual media article that what this is, it's a future projection based on a model that most scientists at the IPCC have already said is bunk. Okay, and this is covered in chapter two, um, idea and data laundering. Okay, if you look at the PhD thesis, you know, all the caveats, uncertainties, and everything are in there. And yeah. then they, when they go to publish it in the journal, they've got to try to pull out the sexy parts and make the abstract, you know, look attractive and with a title that's, you know, a little bit sexier than the PhD dissertation and, you know, that helps it get published in nature. And so, so you've already, you know, the journal article has left out the inconvenient bits and used some more provocative language. And then you put it in the hands of the journalists. <laughs> okay. And they even further misrepresent it, um, you know, with a, an alarming headline and cherry picking things even further. So the IPCC does the same sort of thing. Um, you know, you have the working group reports, especially working group one report does have some sort of credibility. And I think the six assessment was relatively credible compared to most IPCC reports. But then the summary for policymakers, you know, cherry picks and makes it more alarming. And then the UN officials, um, go completely off the reservation and start talking about code red and climate emergency. So, so what the public sees is carefully crafted spin. It has nothing to do with the real information and intellectual content of the original studies. And that you see that 
over and over again with just about I call it climate vorticity. Climate vorticity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we often make a point to reference the original reports because it's generally accepted on on that side as being, you know, something that they're willing to listen to. And and then as you as you take steps down, as you're saying, to the summary to policymakers, then the actual events, you you lose all the signs that was once actually somewhat useful. So we have a question here from Jacob H. Who says, how can we de-escalate this climate hysteria? That's a good question. Okay. Part three give some solutions. Okay, and, and I'll, I'll give you a preview. I mean, what we've got right now is we've got people on, oh, I'd have to go way back. Okay, I'm gonna have to go way down. Let's see, go way down further. Uh, further, yep. Yeah, uh, risk management. <laughs> okay, jumping right ahead. Go down to the decision-making under deep uncertainty. Yes. Okay. Oops. Uh, Oh, no, okay. right, right, right here. Yeah. It, okay, it's, perfect. It's the bottom right. Okay. So it, it's the policy making framework. It's speaking consensus to power. That's what we've been operating under. Okay. So who controls a consensus? <laughs> you know, it has the power to control the policy outcome under this, you know, predict then act um, kind of. Mm -hmm scenario. Now, under the decision making under deep uncertainty, I mean, we forget about trying to agree upon the assumptions. I mean, on one mm -hmm. side, you know, it, it's, it becomes a big war between who whose highly uncertain facts get canonized, and then the other side gets labeled with, with equally uncertain facts, gets labeled as a denier, you know, yeah. and, and there's no rational way to even pick between the two. So the way forward is to get rid of that policy making strategy of predict and act, speaking consensus to power, and go to an agree upon decision approach and not an agree upon assumptions approach. The agree upon decision approach, for example, I mean, if you look at, you know, where do we have common ground? Well, energy efficiency makes sense. Does anybody not agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> We, we, we could use more research and development on energy technologies. Anybody not agree with that? So, so those are some examples. So, you know, once you have a contentious policy debate, highly uncertain science, uh, particularly regarding projections about the future, don't, you know, you're not going to agree. The uncertainties are too great. Let's sort of bypass all that and see what we can come to agreement on. And once you do that, then that opens up room for debate. And, and so characterizing uncertainty and outlining the debate, what we know versus what we don't know, then becomes the strategy rather than manufacturing a consensus, scientific consensus, and then working to enforce it by dismissing anyone who disagrees as a denier. So, so that's the way I, it, it's all tied up in, in this naive view of policymaking um, by mistaking climate change as a simple problem like, ooh, red dye number two causes cancer, better get rid of red dye number two. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. a complex but, adaptive system. Yeah, but, but, yeah. When you get a, but when you have a very complex problem, you know, you have to take a completely different approach. And, and that's the key argument of part three. So, I mean, it's an important point to make now so you can sort of see where I'm going, but we skipped over a lot of stuff in the middle. <laughs> I think the, the important thing to, to point out here is that in all of the history of mankind and all of the different schemes that we've had, you know, to change the weather, sacrificing virgins, uh, you know, witchcraft, all, all these other things, including, you know, reducing carbon emissions so f and so forth. Nothing has ever worked. Nothing. Well, this and, is the, exactly. This is a fallacy of control. We can't control things like the climate. We can't control pandemics. You know what? And this is, again, a big, the earlier part of part three, you know, you have to accurately characterize the problem and and the risk before you decide on what kind of approach makes sense to deal with it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, 
skipping ahead again, the stuff in red is what we're currently doing. We're trying to avoid the hazard. We're yeah. trying to right. control the climate by eliminating CO2 emissions. And we're justifying that based on the precautionary principle, just in case it could be dangerous. And we use cost benefit approaches to justify that, you know, it, we're going to benefit more than it costs. And this requires in that we agree on assumptions and you can get whatever answer you want in these cost benefit analyses just by tweaking the assumptions a little bit. So, mm -hmm. okay. But the way forward is probably better if we go back and work our way through this, you know, the yeah, way do you want me to go back to use, yeah. If you can go back to maybe part two, yeah. uh, skipping up. Oh, next slide. Okay. So the other main point in part two is, you know, well, how should we think about, you know, what we might be facing in the 21st century in terms of climate variability and change? Well, we all know that the IPCC projections are deficient. I mean, even, you know, the IPCC sort of recognizes that the models are running too hot. Um, you know, so over here is a list of the problems. They continue to emphasize implausible emission scenarios. They neglect the lower and more realistic values of climate sensitivity, which Nick Lewis's recent publication shows. They include inadequate scenarios of solar variability, internal climate, climate variability, and volcanic eruptions. And the ones in blue are expected to tilt things in the colder direction in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. The purple internal climate variability can go either way, but in the next few decades, I think it will be on the cool side. And the bottom line, and the IPCC even recognizes this, is that climate models are inadequate for projecting regional climate change and extreme weather events. Well, that's what people care about. Yeah. I mean, like, we don't really care about the global average temperature because no whatever that means. I mean, nobody feels the global average temperature. It's yeah. really regional climate change and extreme weather events and the climate models are unfit for their purpose. And you know, if you take these into account, the, the temperature by 2100 could easily be below two degrees C, which is the so-called threshold of catastrophe. Big uh, point. <laughs> if you believe the UN. Okay, so what do I propose we do? I'm um, going on to the right-hand side. So there are alternative methods of generating climate change scenarios. The first thing you have to do is escape from model land. That rather catchy phrase comes from the title of a book, recent book published last year by Erica Thompson. I mean, these models are useful for some things, but for, you know, making credible predictions of things we care about in the 21st century and the basis for policy making, they simply shouldn't be used. Instead, we can use what's referred to as a storyline approach for scenario generation. And you can do this on either a global or local basis using observations, theory, and basic climate dynamics understanding. Um, the the storyline approach was so labeled by um, scientist uh, Ted Shepard at the University of Reading and the IPCC in the later chapters on regional climate change um, talks about the storyline approach. So this isn't something I've made up, but I've taken it and run with it, okay? And I, I use this approach to, um, for both global, global and local um, climate scenario development. And it's particularly useful for developing scenarios of extreme weather and climate events in terms of frequency and magnitude. Um, chapter nine in the book talks about plausible worst case scenarios, like what's the worst that can happen here? And that's um, an important thing to consider in many decision making frameworks. And this goes into, well, yeah, you can make up a lot of wild and crazy scenarios. Which ones should we take seriously? And then mm -hmm. there are some serious ways for evaluating this. And then you can use this approach for stress tests, for uh, your infrastructure, for your electric utility system, whatever. And most importantly, developing a broad range of scenarios is that this supports robust decision-making st strategies, which takes us into part three. And the other thing is you can include everybody's scenario. You know, you don't have to say, this is the one. 
you can include scenarios that say it's going to cool and you can actually justify um, those scenarios. It might be, I mean, there's a non-trivial chance that we could see cooling over the next two decades. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we have big volcanic eruptions and internal variability and whatever, th th this approach gives rooms for everybody's scenario to be included. Um, yeah. You can weight their likelihood, I'm but sorry. you know, th there's no reason to do the consensus enforcement thing. You know, let's look at the whole range and then start with that and narrow them down and think, you know, pick which ones we think are most likely based on the inputs and the method of generation and go from there. We have another question here that I'd like to bring up. This is from okay. Richard Voss. He says, why is it that climate change construed as a science is uniquely exempt from having to demonstrate statistical significance to draw its conclusion? <laughs> Okay, the level of uncertainty is so high that we don't have meaningful PDFs. And if you don't have meaningful PDFs, um, you don't really have a basis for um, calculating statistical significance other than you know minor things like error bars on global temperature measurements or anything like that. But if you're talking about probabilities of future climate change from IPCC scenarios, I mean, the, the basis, all those different ensembles from um, the climate models don't provide a basis for forming a, a robust PDF. So in the absence of a robust PDF, you don't really have a basis for statistical significance. So, so what we, so we're in the, this is chapter five, the uncertainty monster, where I go into how we characterize uncertainty. And we're in the realm, it's really, I don't have a slide for that, oh, okay. but we're in the realm of scenario uncertainty. You know, we can sort of bound what might be happen, but we don't really have a basis for, um, much of a basis for assessing likelihoods and certainly not for a mean or a best guess or anything like that. So, so that's how I characterize the uncertainty. And I think the whole statistical uncertainty, and this is used by the economists and their cost benefit analysis and stuff like that. And it's, and it's meaningless precision. And it, it's, it's misleading in all honesty to think that it, it, it makes the knowledge base look more complete than it is. Yeah, a good example of meaningless precision is when we get declarations about this is the hottest year ever, and it's 0 0.0222 degrees centigrade above normal or whatever, or or above the, the, the past maximum. I mean, so what? That, that precision isn't, isn't meaningful because we can't measure the temperature of the globe that accurately. No, no, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. Um, yeah, and if you look back far enough into the record. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the historical record, you know, back into the 19th century, or better yet, if, if paleoclimate data is available, there's always going to be some worse event that occurred, you know, in the historical record or the paleoclimate record. I mean, it's very unusual. Right. <laughs> I have another question here that is, is pretty interesting. Um, this is from Matt G. The question is, mm -hmm. will AI be able to finally accurately predict climate change? Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, AI is a fabulous tool, and we're using it in our weather forecasting, and I use it in developing my future climate scenarios, you know, with natural climate variability. So, so I use it. But we're in the realm of the uncertainty that we deal with is irreducible. Um, you know, there, there's two kinds. Again, this is chapter five. Um, we have epistemic uncertainty that we can reduce. You know, if only we made more measurements and thought harder, we could reduce it. Then we have what's called ontic uncertainty or aleatory uncertainty, um, which are big words, but it, it's basically irreducible. So now Anthony will relate to this because it's like the initial condition uncertainty when you run a weather forecast model, you run a bunch of different ensemble members. That, that's an example of the irreducible uncertainty, the ontic uncertainty. And when you have a chaotic nonlinear system like the atmosphere, 
Um, you know, you just have irreducible uncertainty in predicting this for it. And this isn't even to mention like the sun and things like that and volcanoes that we really can't predict. Um, so no, that's just in a deterministic sense, it certainly is not predictable, but we can imagine, this is the storyline approach, all the different things that might happen and in combinations and put together a scenario. And then we have a richer set of scenarios to think about in terms of our risk assessment. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the uncertainty monster that you've rightly pointed out years ago is, is really the key to the whole thing. I mean, we are making policy decisions without really considering the huge amount of uncertainty that's involved. And atmospheric systems are dynamic and chaotic and climate systems are the same way over a much longer scale. Predicting chaos is not something that either a climate model or AI is really going to be good at because these things all tend to work on a more linear basis. And yeah, you can't predict, is there going to be a volcano popping up? Are we going to see more wildfires? Uh, is you know All these different uncertainties out there are really tough to figure into the final equation. And so that's why you see, uh, I remember um, one of the, the comments from uh, Patrick Michaels was uh, about fat tails of climate predictions in the future. And if you look at the graph, you know, you see them diverging, getting fatter as they go into the future. And that basically is the increasing uncertainty of the prediction as you go into the future. So, I mean, would you really want to bet your whole livelihood, your nation, the world on such uncertainty? Well, apparently some people do. Um, one more word about the uncertainty. Anthony mentioned, you know, the chaos, you know, in, in, in the weather and the atmospheric system. Well, when you couple a chaotic atmosphere to a chaotic ocean under changing external forcing, I mean, we have no idea how to handle that. And the word that's used for that is not chaos, but pandemonium. <laughs> no, no, no. Climate pandemonium. Yes, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if this is something like a runaway of the precautionary principle, right? Because if we have all this chaos and uncertainty into the future, the fat tails effect here, then you know, what we're doing, talking about basically shutting down industrialization um, seems to be a bit of a overreaction considering that uncertainty, but people will still come in and say, yeah, but if we are, then isn't it better if we shut this stuff down now to prevent the weather from getting worse? And I, it's such a complicated question because there are so many elements at play in that, that it's really difficult to argue that point, you know, just because of how complicated it is. Okay. Yeah. This yeah. question kind of Here's represents one. that. Yeah. That's a perfect segue into part three, which is the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So the issue is that, we have badly mischaracterized climate risks and we're proposing the wrong actions for the wrong reasons. You know, any careful assessment of climate risk and application of risk management principles from risk science would tell you that. And here are statements from two leading thinkers on risk. Um, without reading the whole thing, that climate change risk and uncertainties are poorly presented and we're arguing for the wrong actions for the wrong reasons. And this pretty much sums it up by experts in Rick's science who have no particular dog in the climate fight. Now, Terje Aven, the one on the top one, has actually looked at the climate problem a bit, um, but he takes the IPC stuff completely at face value, including the extremely alarming scenarios and the impacts and whatever. And even with that <laughs> perspective of you actually buy the IPCC stuff, he concludes that the climate change risk and uncertainties are poorly presented. And so what I've thought to, sought to do in this part three is to bring the latest thinking in risk science for complex problems, systemic risk, emerging risk, and decision-making under deep uncertainties, bring all these ideas to bear on climate science and the climate risk 
in the context of these scenarios that I've sort of developed in part two. So it's sort of, um, I had to read a whole lot. You know, I, I work in the my company, that's what we basically do is risk management. So I have yeah. practical experience and, and I do, you know, read loosely in the field, but to prepare this book, I just had, I had to read a number of books and hundreds of articles to really spin up and to think about how all this would be applied to the climate problem. So this part three sort of summarizes what I came up with here. And it's, yeah. it, it's different, definitely different from what the UN is saying. So let's go to the, okay. So chapter 10 is how we have mis mischaracterized climate risk. Okay. So, I mean, what we call risks from fossil fueled warming are really convoluted with natural climate variability and are dominated by societal vulnerabilities of poor populations. So blaming, you know, how to actually separate out what is actually being caused by um, fossil fuel emissions is a very difficult thing to do. Um, we've also misperceived the dangers of climate change just due to psychology and the people who communicate this are very um, clever with their propaganda. And there's also been social amplification of risk just by our fear. You know, we're making things worse for ourselves, which is not a good place to be. Um, there's a fundamental um, disagreement across the political spectrum, across different regions, across different cultures, as to whether climate risks are acceptable, tolerable, or intolerable. Um, historically, fossil fuel emissions have been regarded as a tolerable risk. Um, yeah, for sure, there's some downsides, pollution and all that, but the benefits have far outweighed um, the bad things. And of course, we're open to, you know, sure, we can stop using fossil fuels if we have something to replace it with, you know, that isn't more expensive and is equally reliable. So, I mean, that, that's tolerable, but, but the UN negotiators, the code risk, have tried to turn this into an intolerable risk. You know, it's like the don't look up, you know, kind of, you know, movie thing, you know, like an asteroid is headed our way. We need to do something. There's no planet left. You know, we don't do something. And they're trying to push it as the same sort of drop everything. This is the only thing that matters. And the, the scary thing is um, there was an article in The Economist this week about the conflict between you know, emissions reductions and poverty reduction, you know, um, you know, because all, all the money that you, the aid world bank and whatever that used to help Africa and whatever developing countries help reduce their vulnerability to extreme weather, help them develop economically. That's all being used. Um, th that's all being used to, um, reduce emissions, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is not what they need. They need grid electricity. They need to develop their economy. And the point made, whether it was in the article or somebody tweeting about it, I said, what's the point of reducing poverty if the whole planet is destroyed? You know, well, excuse me, <laughs> destroying the planet. But, but that's the only way you can justify all this craziness, you know, is through the existential risk kind of argument, which is totally not justified. Yeah. So, okay. A uh, couple of other things. Another big one um, is we've conflated the incremental warming risks, mm -hmm. such as the slow creep of global warming, the slow creep of sea level rise, the slow melting of glaciers with the emergency risk of severe weather events. Okay, and, and the urgency of reducing emissions are justified by the extreme weather events, which are not related to the yeah. emission, you know, so you've got this, I mean, and this is, you know, capitalized upon by the propagandists who, you know, use every extreme weather event to justify eliminating fossil fuels. <laughs> um, 
The other thing that we've done is mischaracterize the strength of climate knowledge to this manufactured consensus stuff. And if you're characterizing uncertainty is a key thing in the risk assessment. I mean, just because you have deep uncertainty doesn't mean you shouldn't act, but it certainly changes the kind of actions <laughs> that make sense for the current problem. Mm -hmm. And finally, climate change is not a simple, simple problem like red, nine to, red dye number two. It's a <laughs> wicked problem, a wild risk, systemic risk. And the bottom line is that risk control and eliminating strategies just won't work. I mean, we can't control the climate through fossil fuel emissions any more than we could control the pandemic. I mean, it's just not going to work. Yeah. So back over to the, on the right hand side, the risk, man risk management, you know, the, the red stuff is what we've been doing. And these are all three are ill suited to yeah. the which problem of climate change. Okay, let's, yeah. let, let's look at these other categories of risk response. Well, the do nothing people, I mean, this is a viable <laughs> risk management. <laughs> you accept it and you budget for it. I mean, this is FEMA, <laughs> okay? Yeah. You accept it, you know, bad stuff's gonna happen, we budget for it and we fix it as, to the extent we can. Uh, we share the risk. This is where insurance comes in. Um, Catastrophe insurance, catastrophe bonds, insurance links, securities, all that stuff is booming. People, you know, this whole idea of risk sharing makes a whole lot of sense. And this is a big part of what my business does is support these people who are doing live trading of catastrophe bonds and so forth and so on. And the other big one is the reduction of impacts. This is to adapt. Okay, the, the, all three of these, I mean, we're, we're doing all three, but all of, you know, as a matter of course, but this is the one that gets all the emphasis and all the money. I mean, if we took all the money that we were spending here and, and put it into reduction of impacts, boy, we'd be in a way better place. Oh, yeah. Okay. And now, finally, I mentioned this before, but the decision making under deep uncertainty, I mean, to me, this is the way forward. Um, because we have for wicked problems, anytime you have one of these crazy problems, you have to acknowledge the deep uncertainty and you have to use suitable decision making frameworks. And this includes robust decision making strategies. This includes no regret win win type strategies, um, such as. Um, energy efficiency, things that are reversible, flexible, you can change your mind if you have further information, put in safety margins, and don't try to make a decision for 2100, you know, make it on meaningful time scales. And the robust decision making really takes place more on a local level, you know, it's a bottom up kind of thing, not a top down UN, you know, non-governmental control by the UN type strategy. These are decisions that are made, you know, at the lowest <laughs> decision-making levels, you know, a city, a company, you know, maybe a state. So people can secure their common interest, you know, in a broader framework that um, makes sense with larger goals. And the other one is dynamic adaptive decision-making where you, you learn from mistakes, you're able to change course, you're able to accommodate new technologies, new technologies. And this is done by just doing a lot of trial and error and by taking baby steps rather than committing yourself to this crazy, um, this crazily disruptive long-term top-down policy strategy. So it's a way to get, you know, people can agree on this stuff Okay, a lot more than they can agree on the inputs to a cost benefit um, analysis or can agree on, you know, totally disrupting our energy, transportation, agriculture, industrial infrastructure for possibly making a minor impact on the climate in the 22nd century. So, <laughs> so all this is yeah. something, that I, you know, yeah. it, it's just easier to swallow. It's just easier to swallow. Yeah. You know, to sum it up, we've got this unhealthy focus on one thing, 
or maybe two things. Climate change is driven by carbon dioxide and nothing else, and climate change can be predicted by models. That seems to be the narrow focus of everything going on these days. We've got a cartoon here that kind of sums this up. This cartoon came from Josh, our favorite cartoonist, a few years ago. But basically, you know, the big kahuna on the climate earth control machine, you know, we've got water vapor and then <laughs> oceans. I mean, they're just ignoring all this other stuff. And they're surprised when you say to them, well, well wait a minute, what about the oceans or, or what about water vapor? No, 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 it can't be that. It's got to be carbon dioxide. <laughs> Uh, that's it's, good just, it's an unhealthy fixation on one thing. And it's not just unhealthy in terms of what it's doing to our society and focusing on it. It's unhealthy in terms of science. Science is supposed to look at everything. And yet it seems to me that they are routinely ignoring all the other factors, the chaotic nature of climate and weather and the, the things that are natural events. There seems to be no focus whatsoever on looking at natural climate change and studying it. All the money is going into reducing CO2 and making bigger and better models. So I think if we pulled up uh, that question by Luke again, just to put it on screen, because it yeah. kind of is a like the basic question that people ask in regards to that topic. Which one um, is that? Oh, nope, not this one. Uh, uh, wouldn't we as a civilization Okay, so since we're, we also have a, a podcast version of this, we should probably read the questions out loud. <laughs> Wouldn't we as a civilization look for any way to reduce climate change and global warming? Wouldn't we desperately look for any ways, including limiting CO2 output? Um, and I okay. think that you address yeah. that pretty well. Well, that's a good segue into the next slide, actually. Yeah, I mean, right. next, yeah, yeah. The, the, this is, these are the last three chapters of the book, which is really the punchline. Okay, we have to just get over the idea that we can control the climate. I mean, we can reduce, you know, if we were to be successful in reducing, eliminate, you know, net zero by 2050, we probably wouldn't notice any change in the weather or, I mean, there's a lot of inertia in the climate system. Um, we wouldn't really, the sea level rise wouldn't slow down, the ice sheets wouldn't really change much. We wouldn't see much of a change in anything until say the 22nd century. Okay, so um, maybe, um, and there could, who knows, we could have a whole spate of volcanic eruptions, a solar minimum, which would make all this stuff moot anyways by that point. So, you know, there's so much uncertainty why we, we, we can't afford to do that. Um, in terms of mitigation, um, in this chapter, there's a chapter 14, mm -hmm. I talk about, you know, the, the rationale for an energy transition in the 21st century extends beyond CO2 emissions reductions. Um, there's, you know, think about, you know, we want better infrastructure generally for the 21st century. We're going to need a lot more energy, not just electrifying Africa, but, you know, for all of the artificial intelligence and blockchain and quantum this and that, we're going to need a huge amount of electricity going forward. Um, we also, you know, so we want more electricity. Of course, we want it to be cheap and clean. Uh, we want to minimize the land footprint. Um, this is, I mean, the wind and solar thing is having big trouble given its, uh, land footprint. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just not in my backyard, but it's not good for ecosystems either. I mean, that's going to be a huge problem, even in sparsely populated places. Yeah like Canada, Australia, and the US, it's still a big problem. So, I mean, you know, what's the solution? Well, I mean, I'm sure there's, I mean, nuclear is an obvious one. Geothermal seems good. Um, there will probably be new technologies coming down the pike in the coming yeah, decades. I want to point out something about nuclear. A few years ago, when I was at the American Geophysical Union Convention, Dr. James Hansen was giving a keynote address, and I was there in the front row. And um, one of the things that he pushed on, you know, Dr. James Hanson, for those of you who don't know, is the person who started all of this on a big scale. He went before Congress in June 1988 and said, we have a problem. Climate change is going to be a problem. And then he presented his computer models and his three different ABC scenarios. Well, that got the whole ball rolling. Congress decided, let's throw money at it and fix it. But 
what he did say in this AGU meeting, and I believe this was 2013 or 2014 perhaps, is that we need to embrace nuclear. There's no other way, really. The other climate uh, solution, you know, in terms of renewable energy, wind and solar and so forth, just don't have critical mass. We have to embrace nuclear. And so when the father of climate change, essentially, starts saying we have to embrace nuclear, you'd think the world would stand up and listen. But so far, they haven't. Okay, now I have a I have a Jim Hansen anecdote in my book. Okay, so and this is maybe an article four years ago by Naomi Oreskes. I'll find There's it. a new, you know, watch out. There's a new kind of climate denier. Oh. And she basically called Jim Hansen a climate denier for oh. preferring nuclear energy over wind and solar, along with Carrie Emanuel, Ken Caldera, Tom Wigley. Uh, <laughs> it is. Oh, <laughs> Jim Hansen, a climate denier. Okay, this is how <laughs> off the wall people are. I mean, the, the problems with wind and solar. Um, climate is denier that, is anyone who disagrees with anything <laughs> I say. That's pretty much what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now here's the, the problems with what I've had a number of guest posts on my blog and, mm -hmm. and many of them have been cross posted at WUWT um, about the problems with wind and solar. I mean, everyone's familiar. I mean, d just the eyesore and the ecological issues, you know, and the land use issues, everybody gets that. The fact that wind and solar are intermittent Okay, and require backup and um, batteries, a lot of storage, which is very expensive. But but really, the sh uh, that can be solved with money. But the real showstopper is that wind, solar, and even battery storage is asynchronous. In order to keep the grid humming along, okay, you have to have frequency troll and inertia, and you have to keep things moving. You know, if it just flickers off, the whole system crashes, and Remember the Texas cold event of 2021, you know, it was like minutes away from a yeah. crash because they lost frequency control. OK, um, so, I mean, this is very serious. And the only technical way around that is to add synchronous condensers to the grid, which becomes very expensive. So there there's just no good way to do wind and solar beyond about 20 percent penetration. So yep. we just need to abandon, apart from the land, we just need to abandon that. And, and the whole thing about getting rid of fossil fuels, well, it's one thing. In 2100, will we really be burning fossil fuels for fuel, um, transportation, and electricity? Probably not. But fossil fuels are, you know, used for industry and materials and polymers and plastics and, for, you know, it, on and on it goes. I mean, it's... I think fossil fuels will probably be used into the 22nd century, but probably, yeah. hopefully we will have better solutions that are cleaner, cheaper, don't have the same geopolitical risks associated with fossil fuels. So I'm all in favor of slowly working towards, you know, a transition right. away, but these crazy deadlines, artificial deadlines, and say we have to urgently do wind and solar is a you know, as a step back to the 19th century. Yeah, um, it will. That's yeah. what I said at the beginning. It seems like all the solutions are wanting to push us back, you know, to things yeah. like wind power, which we abandoned because it wasn't efficient or reliable or whatever. So we got another question here. Luke Starkenberg says, on your show of uh, January 19th, 2023, uh, Dr. Curry was the guest and she talked about how every major university is awash with oil money funding. I mean, you can't get away with this. Can you address this? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, um, I'll give Georgia Tech as an example. Um, we have a big chemical engineering um, department, huge donations from oil companies. Even my own department, Atmosphere and Ocean Science, we had the Georgia Power Endowed Chair. Um, you know, we had oil company money even in my little department. Um, the California schools, Stanford has a huge amount of oil money. Um, they all do. I mean, part of it's, you know, just investing for, you know, in chemical engineering and developing new petroleum based products. I mean, part of it's that, but um, 
you know, a lot of, you know, just the endowment kind of things um, comes from, you know, these are very big companies. <laughs> they, they spend money at universities. Um, do they influence the climate research? Um, you know, in terms of like climate dynamics, the kind of research that I do, um, I don't believe they do. Yeah. Um, again, again, the case that got the most publicity was Willie Soon, who got funding from the Southern Company, which is the utility provider in Georgia and some of the other Southeast states. And they, they just gave him a blanket grant to support his research. It wasn't tied to, well, say this or say that. I mean, they funded him instead of Jim Hansen or somebody, probably because they liked his research um, and, and thought that it raised questions that challenged the paradigm. But that was, you know, re regarded as totally polluting Willie Soon. I mean, Willie Soon was damaged goods because he got money. Now, my company does work for energy companies and, and even a petroleum company. I mean, mainly stuff like they use our hurricane forecasts, our wind power forecasts, our temperature forecasts. And I occasionally do like what I would call risk assessment, climate risk assessment processes for them. Um, what risk does my solar farm in Southeast US have from hurricanes, things like that. Or what about this power plant I'm putting on the coast? Um, uh, how big of a storm surge should I protect it from? You know, these kind of projects that I do. Uh, nobody's paid me to speak publicly <laughs> in a certain way about climate change. I wouldn't do it. Um, you know, when, when people ask, you know, like I'm somehow polluted by energy company. Well, and my, my, my answer is this. I was making a whole lot more money as a faculty member at Georgia Tech, uh, yeah. salary well into six figures. I mean, more than twice than I've ever made in a single year working in the private sector. So if this was about money, about lining my own pockets, I would have stayed at Georgia Tech and kept playing the game. Yep. Yeah. That's a big problem we've got. <laughs> yeah. So we got one final question here. Uh, this is from Redneck Screw Loose, obviously, <laughs> a fake name. <laughs> I've encountered some people that were surprised that plants convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. When did they stop teaching this? So I don't know. Maybe when they started substituting wokeism for actual education, perhaps? Well, well this, is oh. high school, this is high school biology. I can't believe that this is oh. a taught in high school biology. <laughs> I, would, I would argue that uh, it is still being taught, but there's not much you can do about bad students or people that or people that are taught that pers that fact and also are taught the climate change agenda bullet points and they just don't make the connection. Yeah, I mean, I went to public school. I can, I can say that when you're taught that and it's a dry textbook point and then you're shown an inconvenient truth and told the world's going to end, one sticks with you more than the other, which would kind of just be my overarching point there. Yeah. So do you have any final points you want to make, Dr. Curry, before we wrap it up here? Yeah, I do. If you can go to my last slide. Yep. So the last chapter is climate risk and the policy discourse. And in this chapter... I re-examine, you know, and summarize all, you know, when we look at what's going on here, there are so many hidden assumptions, so many hidden values in all this that never get discussed. They get dismissed. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Are you for the planet or against us? <laughs> you know, it's all dismissed. And there is so much and, and even moral assumptions that have been made that need to be challenged, questioned, and we need to acknowledge the disagreement. And you know, there are frameworks, you know, political frameworks, decision-making frameworks that can all get us out of this rut where we can make sensible decisions. And the, the lower you go down to the decision-making unit, like a city or a company or something like that, the, the better chance you have of actually doing something sensible. These top-down UN things just aren't going to work. And finally... I mean, a lot of this problem has been generated, you know, I mean, the politics of the situation are horrendous, but a lot of the problems have really been generated by the scientists themselves, um, you know, just behaving unprofessionally and lacking hey, knowledge. Where have we seen that before? Maybe last week? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, 
but just lacking knowledge of the policy process, the political process. And, and this is why, and I, I talked about this at the Heartland Conference, the whole wicked science idea where you, you know, explicitly acknowledge the political dimensions of, of some of these scientific problems and you train people to work in this framework where, you know, you deal with policymakers, you deal with stakeholders and whatever, and, you know, you co-produce knowledge. Right now you have, and, and it involves a different type of systems thinking, it involves, you know, focusing on uncertainty. Right now, this is much better situation than we have right now, which is disciplinary climate scientists who become activists and have an outsized impact, you know, on, parroting, you know, consensus enforcement um, and parroting, you know, and amping up the alarm. I mean, that's totally a bad place. And we have to blame a lot of this on the sort of establishment climate scientists and the professional societies who, who have jumped on this and who see this as a big way to bring huge amount of funding and publicity into the field. I mean, I blame a lot of this on the scientists and the universities and administrators who should know better. It's just really been scientists behaving badly, and it's a very sad place to be. Yep, there's been a lot of that. Uh, we've seen it um, all through this discussion, you know, even started back decades ago, you know, when Carl Sagan started talking about Venus, you know, and saying the Earth could become like Venus if we don't do something. This is even before Jim Hansen started mm -hmm. talking about it. So uh, that kind of wraps up our show. Uh, I appreciate everyone being here and uh, joining us with your questions and your comments. Uh, for Dr. Judith Curry, Linnea Lucan, and Andy Singer, I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate, reminding you to go go and get Climate, Uncertainty, and Risk by Dr. Curry. You can find that on Amazon. Just look it up, Climate, Uncertainty, and Risk, and um, buy that book because it tells you a lot of good things and gives you a lot of good solutions that you won't hear from people like Dr. Michael Mann and other folks that tend to see climate as a hair on fire type of an issue. All right, that wraps it up. Thanks for joining us. Have okay. a good day and a great weekend. Bye-bye.